So today on the podcast, we're going to talk about Twitter, but not really whether Donald Trump got thrown off or whether Elon Musk is going to buy it. We're going to talk a little bit about what Twitter actually does in the world. We know all about the communication, but we also have to take a step back and see who is using it and to what end. So a recent study that has been published will tell you that the Taliban in Afghanistan, who are a brutal, brutal organization that now allegedly run the country, used Twitter to very, very powerful purpose uh, to take that country over. This study has been conducted by four universities, Princeton, U of A, uh, Maryland, and the University of Regina, which is where we've reached out to Dr. Brian McGuinn. He is a professor of politics and international studies and the co-founder of the Center for Artificial Intelligence, Conflict and Data. Now, that is a mouthful. I was going to um, say that. <laughs> it's, easier, <laughs> it's easier read than it is said. Yeah, and I think I'm going to call you Brian, and I don't think <laughs> I'm going to give you every title. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And you can just call it SIDAC, but I, which is what I will call it. But Brian is just fine. I prefer yeah, it. But everybody else calls me. And Pamela is just fine on this end, too. So um, you and I have both had some experience with uh, this. I spent uh, a, a fair amount of time in Afghanistan when our troops were there. You lived in Libya and embedded yourself with the resistance uh, to uh, to Gaddafi. And this is where you started, I guess, where the penny was dropping for you that war was being live streamed. Literally. <laughs> and we, I mean, we see it now with 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 a number of different. Con- I mean, everyone is now experienced with the Ukraine the extent to which this is being right. done. But this was, you know, ten years ago, and uh, Syria really was the first in Syria kind of took it to the next next level, where we saw social media completely transform the nature of of how conflict is understood and how civil wars were being fought. That has now continued on. Um, if you remember back to the Arab Spring, um, mm-hmm. Facebook and Twitter were seen as these kind of powerful forces for democracy because they were helping a small group of people uh, challenge the state. And in the case of the Arab Spring, where we had largely just sort of citizens voicing their concern for the first time of, you know, a bunch of uh, men who've been in power for 40 years and were sort of autocrats and, and dictators of some pretty extreme nature. And so Twitter and Facebook and social media was kind of the, the bastion of democracy and was going to transform and and be a, a proponent of democracy. Unfortunately, 10 years on, we also see how you know anti-vaccine groups and others, whether you know, whatever your perspective on, on the convoy that went to, to Ottawa, the ability of a small group of people to challenge the state. <laughs> and it turns out that social media is absolutely neutral about the nature of that small group and the nature of the state and any of their purposes or whether anything is based on facts or not. Um, and that it's a much less advocacy for democracy. In fact, it's transforming yeah. democracy in some really fundamental ways. And so well, this, this is the, the question about, I mean, when we landed in Afghanistan, I was amazed because they skipped the whole landline um, yep. part of development and everybody and their dog quite literally had a cell phone. Yeah. And that is how people communicated. And I know our troops, for example, gave uh, cell phones to sympathetic local leaders and I witnessed them helping warn people of don't go down that road because there's, you know, it's IED laden and all of those things. So here's this amazing tool being used by a group of repressive fundamentalists in the most modern way uh, then, but then as they returned to power, you talked about how they built uh, social support for that through this network. And so in the five months, so one of the reasons we started looking at this was to truly try to understand what role did social media play in the takeover? Right. Because if you remember the takeover on August 15th, there was a shock at how the collapse. I mean, no matter which Afghan expert you were talking to, all of them were completely shocked. This just collapsed in a matter of, of days. So we went back and said, well, why was that? And so mm-hmm. one of the explanations is social media. We said, well, how do we quantify this? So we looked at the 63 sort of main leadership accounts of the Taliban, which, of course, most of which have been on Twitter for years, some of them yeah. a decade, yeah. and said, okay, well, how much 
were they able to produce on Twitter and how much, you know, what was the larger ecosystem? So of those 63 accounts in the four and a half months before, they produced 100,000 tweets that were then basically reached an audience of 2 million people. And that was all in an ecosystem of 126,000 Twitter accounts. So the, the Taliban were able to create this incredible supportive community that amplified everything that they did. Now, the thing that was truly shocking, and it's uh, we'll go over here and then come back, but on these Taliban sites and accounts, we also saw Western advertising. Yes. Banks from Canada, McDonald's. Yes. Yes. Th this is beyond belief. And and so this is the the sort of, I think one of the things that was most shocking for us is that if you actually look at it, of these 63 accounts that have, you know, the spokesperson's name in English, you know, I am the, the spokesperson for the Taliban in English. So this is all completely yeah. in the open. You also then, if you were to, to look at that page, you would have CIBC, Royal Bank, McDonald's Canada, and multiple. So that basically Twitter was monetizing those accounts and continues to even to this day. Um, and hasn't in any way interrupted that. Of those 126,000 accounts, 49, we could only find 49, had been moderated in any way or shut down at some point. So work out the percentage of that. It's very small. <laughs> this, this is a really, really huge issue. And I, I mean, obviously, I don't want to leave the impression that the banks were deliberately advertising of course not. Of course on a not. Taliban site. This is just how Twitter works. Right. Um, your stuff shows up, whoever, you know, when you have, uh, you've purchased promotional time, exactly. then it shows up wherever Twitter decides it should show up. And what's even more shocking is some of the accounts that were moderated, if you know, you said, said it says they're sensitive, and if you click through, they're still advertising on those. <laughs> so there's a complete disconnect between the moderation team and the advertising team, you could tell, um, where they, they really didn't have any connection at all. And again, this is just one example. I'm sure if you were to go to different countries and look at you know, some equally terrible things, you're also going to find those accounts there. Not because they're choosing to, but once you put it into the system, it just pops up wherever you know, it, it pops up. And I haven't seen a bank president anywhere saying, uh, I'm sorry about this, folks. We, we didn't know this was happening. Uh, there hasn't, there hasn't, no one's asked them yet, which has been a bit of a surprise for us. I yeah. mean, it's only been out for a few days, but yeah. it, it is summer and it is July um, that's, and, that's and Roe versus Wade and everything else has gone on in the United States. But we'll see in the yeah. next week or two, whether this shows up, maybe, maybe through this conversation. It gets to a very fundamental point because we're dealing with legislation uh, that's coming forward from the government, very specifically focused on content uh, moderation and control, and even in my view, in many cases, censorship. So how are we so worried about what people may be saying here in in our country as part of open democratic democratic discussion, where we still have some semblance of free speech? And how are we letting Vladimir Putin and the Taliban <laughs> stay on Twitter? Whatever they want. Like, uh, this is, I mean, this is one of the fundamental questions. And I mean, this is one of how, you know, the very fundamental natures and why we set up the center was to begin to start trying to quantify and better understand, because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but to actually be able to comprehensively study this. So, right. uh, you know, we ended up looking at 2 million tweets that those 100,000 tweets were then amplified and, and sort of transitioned into this big ecosystem. You know, 2 million tweets is we need to set AI and the machine learning systems to be able to help us comprehensively look at that. And so we're going to be casting those machines a different now in, into some of the Canadian um, uh, dynamics that you're talking about, whether it be sort of right wing extremism um, or other other versions or left wing of extremism. I mean, that's it's, it's not really important. It's just extremism. understanding it, yeah, exactly in some fundamental way. And, and it, it, but it does. It, it, I mean, we look at what happens in the U.S. We look, but even you don't have to go that far. You look at the anti vaxxing um, you know, the power of the anti vaxxing um, coalition here mm -hmm. in Canada, mm -hmm. or even you know the, the the convoy that went to Ottawa. Whatever you think of the politics, yeah. their ability to raise more money than the three political parties in a week than the political parties raised in a year yeah. is all through social media. So it is, it is also amplifying the ability of a very small group to have an incredibly oversized impact on, on a democratic society. And so it's not about having a free voice. The question is which ones are amplified and how and why. Yeah. Um, which is exactly what we're looking at through this legislation, which is who gets to decide yes, what yeah. voices and what substance is being amplified and what is being repressed and, and shoved down. So this is so key to, to a 
to even a separate debate that is going on here. One of the phrases you use, and I'd like you to expand a little bit, this study was a test case, you say, uh, in human in the loop AI. <laughs> okay, human in the loop, artificial intelligence, is how it impacts social media, how it's transforming yeah. conflict, war, politics. Actually, it's transforming everything. But Pretty much transforming. We, we try to limit what we focus on. That, that's yes. pretty broad enough. <laughs> Um, so the, the point is this, is that uh, most uh, most autonomous systems, most machine learning systems, if you can think of autonomous driving, the whole point is to take humans yeah. out of the system. Yeah. But the fact is with conflict, with any of these social ma- media dynamics, things are happening so fast, or in the case of Afghanistan, it's happening in five languages, there are nuances, that you actually need the experts involved. But the fact is you've got 2 million tweets, so the experts can't read 2 million tweets. And it's actually... Right. The set of machines go out and find patterns, and then the the actual experts say, oh, that's weddings, and that's birthdays, so you can get rid of those. But wait a second, what is this? We've never seen this before. Go out and find more. And so in some ways, the the machines help the the researchers and the experts do better, and then the experts kind of train the machines, become more finely tuned. Because what we found is that you have to do this conflict by conflict, almost uh, actor network by actor network. And you can't just... Uh, it's not just sort of these generic systems that you can build. They have to be highly contextualized, highly focused on a particular area. And that requires experts who then learn. I mean, our experts, the things that we found, they were, you know, they were blown away by certain things that we found. And then like, give me a couple of examples. One was the extent to which um, the Taliban were live tweeting events. So, I mean, one of the policies of, of, of Twitter is that, you know, you can't uh, advocate violence. Well, if you are live tweeting, live tweeting the takeover of a city. So a tank was killed on this street. Three people were just killed on the, and you know, we've now got to this street and they're literally live tweeting the Taliban's rolling into a city um, that's happening in multiple cities simultaneously. Um, But to be able to see those patterns and realize actually they're using different languages for different audiences, different imagery for different audiences, all enabled to, we started instead of saying the Taliban are using Twitter to advocate, you know, whatever strategy, we could actually start to break down the five or six or seven distinct strategies with distinct images. And the the machines found some of those patterns and was able to sort of say, how are these all tied together? So using particular images, it might be okay. Uh, We're coming in, we're gonna flatten your particular building, town or city. The next message might be, we are coming and life is going to be beautiful. And this is one of the things I have to say that I, I was surprised and some of our researchers were surprised is you also, because a lot of the stuff is anecdotal normally until you can actually look at that, all of it. And you actually look at the percentages and we didn't, we didn't actually able to calculate all the percentages, but we, we started working through this. The amount of messages about the sort of euphoria and the utopia after they take over their town was actually a significant proportion, almost more than anything else. And so you think of partly because of our exposure here with Islamic State and others of kind of it's all going to be violence. And, you know, this, frankly, that's actually a very, even for the Islamic State, it was actually a very small part of what they put out um, to, in general. To the English language world, yes, they do all that. Yes, but yes. in the local languages, they are actually saying all, you know, all these interviews of people saying, I'm so glad the Taliban are here. You know, life yes. is finally getting back to normal. And so a big part of that uh, ecosystem was about amplifying this message of, you, you should wait till they come because then everything is better. And so that was really about transforming um, how the entire country saw them and the inevitability of their victory. This is more than softening the ground, as it were. This is creating social license where yes. people are actually willingly embracing a regime that is going to be extremely violent and repressive. And it already has been. I mean, and we tried to quantify that because people push back on us and say, well, yes, but proportionally, how much is it? So we took the 18 largest media outlets in the country and looked at their kind of online engagement um, and able to quantify that just as we did with the Taliban. So the Taliban's 63 accounts and all that they put out there had four times more engagement than all 18 media things combined. So they basically accounted for the majority of what this, the entire Afghan world was receiving as far as messages. But After I bet years of that, you can see how it transforms right. people's perception of things. But we're also seeing that shift happen here. 
yes. as you watch <laughs> mainstream media numbers yes. crash and burn, yes. um, you know, or uh, reduce so significantly that, and and I find it in, in my social group and certainly the younger generation, I mean, they yes. don't, they never get their news through television. Facebook. Yeah, they don't buy a newspaper. Like, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. this becomes very, very crucial in terms of how we even have discussions about elections or leaderships or our democracy or truck convoys or what, whatever. Uh, the it is literally the information. It's not, it's, it's yeah. the, the basic facts, of, you know, in, in parentheses, air quotes, the basic yeah. facts of what's happening in the world um, and what's important. Because it's always not just, you know, people think it's, you know, left wing or right wing kind of yeah. take on things. No, it's just that they don't even know about you know, like the example in, in some people in, in the certain networks in, in the U.S., the January 6th, um, b- basically the, the panel and the discussions don't show up even as having been happening. Right. Like it's that. <laughs> so it's no, not even about everything. It's like the extremes. It, it doesn't happen on Fox and on MSNBC. It's all that happens. We're conducting a, a show trial, right? Because yes. there's actually no ability for people to question. Neither of those things is a plus. Right? Exactly. But and so, so it's it's not just what the fact it's not even you know it's literally what the facts are and what is actually important to what's happening in the world. Yeah, so it's very very fundamental. And what's funny is if you think Canada is bad, there's countries like the Philippines where somewhere <laughs> upwards of ninety percent of of adults get their news through Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think those numbers would be higher here if if people were being you know if they were being asked I think it's, the right it's upwards of eighty percent. A good portion <laughs> yeah. of people's news comes through sort of social media of one kind or another, and that's transformative. The other thing that was, and and I guess we witnessed this both during the conflict and then in this most race, recent, um, uh, as you say, lightning speed takeover by the Taliban with no resistance. They are also um, so more, much more sophisticated yes. than NATO and our allies. They're making, <laughs> you know, war decisions and yeah. and all of those things in a moment. And you know, NATO's going to have a meeting in six months, in you know, to discuss these questions. Like we're we're eating their dust. And and I shouldn't laugh because the, the consequences of this are going to be yeah. horrific, and the, we're yeah. bearing this out. But to me, it's it's just the and I, I have some engagement with the United Nations on a few of these issues, and I remember talking to an official there. And they, you know, many of groups and, and countries were meeting with Taliban leadership in advance of, of, yep. of August 15th because it was part of trying to get access to certain areas, creating humanitarian corridors. But the Taliban, they would literally walk out of the room and the Taliban would be tweeting what the purpose of the meeting was and to basically communicate with them standing with an ambassador, them standing with a UN person saying, Look, we are a government in waiting. Even the international community is treating us like a government in waiting. Is meeting and the us, UN right. would spend three or four days putting out a press release, but by then, yeah, the world has moved on. They've missed the moment, and and to the point where, in some of our stuff, we weren't able to quantify this, but looking at the number of tweets we were, is that in some ways the social media strategy became the dominant strategy, and the the kinetic or the fighting actually was subservient to the to the social media strategy, right. So, and the Americans tried to open up a YouTube account, which had like 10 postings over a year, like versus the Taliban, which had, you know, 100,000 and then, you know, was then retweeted 2 million times. They're, you know, they're, they're just fighting two completely different wars. So can we, I mean, we do see younger uh, governments or younger leaders using exactly. social media a little Incredible. bit more effectively. Uh, Pierre Polyev's running his whole campaign yes. essentially yes. Uh, on on social media, but these international bodies that are making decisions about vaccines and how we react to uh, COVID arriving and. Um, how to respond to or whether COVID exists <laughs> or whether, yes. I mean, all of these things like is the penny not dropping anywhere in at the UN at NATO in leadership systems yeah you're shaking your head and that's I'm shaking I'm... my head sorry it's a podcast <laughs> not, not to do physical gestures um, it's it's uh, I mean these systems are, are, you know, these these bodies are known for moving kind of incrementally. It's why, you know, we, we, we work in the best of times. In the best of times, right? Um, but no, this is this is what it's upending a lot of, and it's the people who are able to take advantage of that, um, and that's on any side of that spectrum, right? And I, I think you can really show that it's, um, you know, Zelensky in in the Ukraine is is 
his, large part the support that he's been able to, to garner is because of his presence and his savviness. Um, but he's always been a media star. I mean, he's an actor yes. at some level. Yes. Um, so he, he has a natural inclination for that and did even before the, the conflict. But Correct. it's it's going to there's going to be a real distinction, I think, between those who can and those who can't. And uh, it's going to have a significant impact on on their success. I, there's just now, obviously, you know, you have, you know, charisma and leadership and other things yeah. that are important. But the capacity to understand how to crack that code um, in the next five, 10 years until, you know, some way of I don't say reigning in. But <laughs> right now it's the Wild West of social media. Um, yeah. Uh, exactly. I think we're going to look, some people talk about sort of remember big tobacco and the fact that we all yeah. smoked on airplanes and stuff. And we right. think back and that's insane. I think when you look at 11 year olds, you know, on TikTok for five hours yeah. a day, we're yeah. going to go back and treat and look at it similarly, where it was just kind of like, how did we not realize this was rewiring yeah. a society and rewiring 11 year old brains? And, and maybe children that under six shouldn't smoke <laughs> or tweet. <laughs> 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 It'll, that'll be written in a museum somewhere, but it will, <laughs> might all, we might all be gone by that point. I want to come back to uh, to Liz, uh, Zelensky, both on content and the form, because, you know, um, you remember the powerful images over time, you know, the napalm girl right. uh, in Vietnam, Kim yeah. Folk, who's gone on to lead a very constructive life here in Canada. Uh, the young man staring down the tank, Tiananmen yeah. Square. Yeah. Uh, the Syrian, the young Syrian boy, two years old, drowned on on the shore, and and what it it did, it triggered this outpouring of uh, support. So those are kind of, well, some of them last over time. The the role of of Zelensky, he has used this very powerful. He did garner our support and attention, but the other side of it is we haven't really delivered. Um, to the extent that he expected. Uh, and again, we just saw the decision this week on turbines sending them to Germany so that they can go to Russia and him getting on the phone with the prime minister and saying, this is not we, what we thought sanctions meant. Um, we thought they meant. So in the end, um, how powerful is it? It has that moment and everybody reacts for a week or two or a month or two but has it fundamentally changed our behavior? And I'm back to the alliances again, the NATOs and the UNs, like, right. where are we? I mean, I think this is the question that we are going to live out in the next 10 years. And I don't think anyone has a, you know, obviously to, to predict that is, yeah. <laughs> uh, is a fool's errand. But what if I think is important. If we were that smart, we would be, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. But I just think that yeah. a lot of this isn't written. I think a lot of these parts yeah. are still in, in, and you have competing dynamics. Um, where, uh, I mean, even if you look at, you know, Trump's use of social media, yes, Twitter was very important, but you remember he's still, you know, he was still looking for images that, you know, and yep. TV moments. So, so th there's still, the, it's also a matter of how those social media are a avenue and, a, and sort of a fire hose for more typical TV images mm -hmm. that, that are still important in transforming who we are and, and how we see a situation. So I think that to answer your question, some things like with Syria, the problem is you can bring a lot of attention to a situation, but um, you still have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of armed groups. You have a, a sort of quagmire militarily, unless the world was going to send in 150,000 troops, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a resolvable situation. You know, in that sense, it's, it's not easily fixed by just attention and, and effort, right. and as opposed to a, a political campaign. Um, that's one where, so I think we're going to find that in some ways, um, social media is more suited for certain types of, of, of sort of public opinion and the behaviors that are elicited, which is voting, which is relatively simple. In the mm -hmm. case of Syria, you have to transform government policy yeah. at a fundamental level. And people might be supportive of the situation and of the, of the refugees trying to escape, but not necessarily supportive of sending in 50,000 troops who are going to die when they're there and a lot of them are going to die and after Afghanistan and then the pullout, yeah. what does the going in pull out? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, we were there yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Two or three times longer than well, five times longer than some of the world wars. 
So, and, and what did it accomplish? The Taliban are back in power. And so there's a, I won't say a cynicism, but I think there's a reality of, of what does yeah. certain things accomplish. So I think that's where the challenge is, is you don't just use one tool for that fixes everything yeah. or breaks everything, frankly. But what, but what you seem to be saying and, and the research seem, when, when you look at how strategically, whether it's strategic information or disinformation, mostly exactly. in this case, disinformation, but it, it's almost easier for the malicious actors Yes, you know, yeah. the, the Taliban in Afghanistan, where you've got a controlled um, environment, yeah. controlled environment, largely an uneducated population. There are certainly uh, cities where, uh, you know, used to be a, a, a big university town, all of those things. But you can tell people that it's going to get better. It would be harder to do that in Canada. Exactly. And that's, I mean, between uh, without getting into the sort of fragmentation of the media market in the US and it's yeah. it's largely re responsible for i think a lot of what's going on there the i think what you're getting at though is that certain issues so for example the taliban able to control an entire environment it's a relatively small environment it's a relatively right. captured yeah. population that's not getting a ton of other information at the same time they also had an incredibly effective military operation and so it's i think it's going to be the combination of the two like good advertising if you've got a terrible product People rush out and buy it and realize you have a table product. Right. It's going to be the combination of those two things that allowed them to, to very much do that. Um, and, you know, they were able to successfully withstand. Um, you forget that they sent a letter of, of surrender when the Americans first invaded um, that the Americans ignored. Boy, do they regret mm -hmm. that. Um, yep. But they were able to, after, you know, five or six or eight years, you know, kind of resurrect themselves and, and fight back. So that was real at that level. Um, but fascinatingly enough, most of what they put out was not disinformation. This is the other thing that we found surprising. Disinformation was a very, very small part of what they were actually putting out. It's a bit like Dante's um, definition of the devil. He lied, you know, told the truth and half truths. And it's actually the combination. Because if you're, if you're largely say, telling the truth, events, these are the events that are happening. When you yep. do, and they did in some cases say we took over a town when they hadn't in order to sort of push the remaining military to basically surrender and it worked in some cases but that's only because they were telling the truth all the rest of the time that it, yeah. it was it was it was therefore plausible that what they were saying is true if you lie all the time then no one believes what you're saying and that's what for us was really interesting was it's disinformation is most powerful in a context of largely of truth <laughs> of uh, uh, let's say plausible information obviously yes, they would exaggerate yes. they would exaggerate you know how many yeah. of their people were killed versus how many they killed but the fact is they still took over that town. Um, right. And so it's it's an interesting dynamic. It's not just pure disinformation. Um, it's really the combination that, at least at that much larger level, uh, being able to shape a population's perception. So the, those are unique circumstances and and I and and we, you know, that's obvious and and we know that. So what do we take from this? And I'm sure you at the AI group are going to be studying this for uh, the rest of your adult life. Yes. Um, <laughs> what's, what's left of it anyways, yes. <laughs> what do we do about that balance between free speech, uh, allowing differing views? I mean, this is what democracy is about. Don't fight it with a gun, you know, fight it with a better <laughs> idea, you know, that notion. Um and and the need to silence the really bad actors, it's very hard as we're witnessing now, even with Twitter, to make content moderation real. I mean, you can have an algorithm that picks out every word that says, you know, you can, but but as you say, they might be celebrating a Taliban birthday, not yes. a Taliban yes. incursion. So right? here's here's so one of the things that in North America we've been told by Silicon Valley is that this moderation thing is really hard. And we identify yeah. certain kind of edge cases in gray areas where obviously it is very hard. But let's look at the Taliban example. It's one of the reasons why we did this report is yeah. that the vast, like, and, I, and I, I forget the exact number, but I think it was in the 80% of the, of the material produced by the Taliban advancing all the things we just talked about at the time when they were killing Canadians, by the way, and yeah. killing Americans. Yep. Um, uh, was produced by 10 or 12 accounts. So it's not that this is some, and if we look at the same thing with the anti-vaxxing in the world, it was like the majority of the anti-vaxxing material. And I'm talking the hardcore, just, yeah. I mean, utter and total nonsense um, based on nothing was being produced by like 20 accounts. 
in the world. And so uh, sometimes this it's so hard is actually, no, it's just this is expensive. And one of the reasons why we produce this report is not, as I said, a gotcha moment, but as yeah. a way of saying, here are some actual ways that the companies can approach and use that are more effective. For example, if you track the actual network itself and you see what they're doing, you know what they're going to do. You don't just track hashtags and words right. um, because you can see what's going to happen. You see how they're adjusting. And the fact is, even the moderation that they were doing, they're not even enforcing their own policy. The, the idea that they are enforcing the policy is actually a fabrication. And this it is something that's put forward in North America. But as soon as you leave North America, it's not true. 87% of Facebook's moderation money is spent in North America. 93% of their users live outside of North America. Right. So if they do a bad job here, imagine the rest of the world where it's basically well, non-existent. Okay, so you're you're basically saying, and and ironically, Twitter is the most cooperative in dealing <laughs> with people. Yes, this is why they get, they get bludgeoned the most because they're the ones you can do the most research because they give the most data. All, most of the other companies, almost all the other companies, don't allow you to do the research that we we do. So it's, right. and I always say this in discussions, is that while we are sort of focusing on them, that's partly because they allow this kind of research, yeah. and that's you know to their credit in that sense. But you're you you are making the case that content moderation is possible. It's it's yes. not as complicated as it looks. But you have to do the work that says you know what there are, there are five accounts um, putting this information out. So let's look at those five bad actors. I'm not saying they're the Taliban. I'm saying people who may be putting out information. Most people would say the Taliban are bad actors, but I think that's yes, a, that's I, a safe one. I think that's a safe one. <laughs> But, you know, people here who might be genuinely questioning um, the role of vaccines and whether it's helpful in all cases, simply yeah. asking questions, you know, exactly. this, this came at everybody very quickly. Yeah. So how do you separate the conversation that people are having about what are you going to do? Should you give it to your five year old? Should you not? I mean, I'm worried. I heard this story, blah, blah, blah. Right. right. From people in in five or six accounts that are saying this is poison being you know bill gates is putting microchips in you. and and so this is the you know this is where north america is distinct from europe because we have a different political past we don't have world war ii and the rise of of the third right and other um sort of experiences where basically i mean this is the paradox of democracy that it gives the tools of those who are anti-democratic to be able to exactly you know, to attack the, I mean, so democracy is an ongoing battle as opposed to, I think we just like to build something and then it's done. Yeah. This idea that, that the paradox of, of democracy, and I think social media, um, while that is, you know, I think most people understand that theoretically from a, but I think social media, again, if I go back to the beginning of our conversation, a small group of people able to challenge the status quo and challenge the state, mm -hmm. that also means those who are, it, it empowers the anti-democratic voices who would otherwise just be your crazy uncle. Now yeah. all the crazy uncles in the world have formed a group <laughs> and yeah. they're amplifying and, and, and um, there's an, they're sort of radicalizing each other and then becoming yeah. their own. And I think that's, that's to me where it, it comes down to is it's not a matter of, I mean, free speech is obviously fundamental and, and I will always argue for anyone's right to say anything, however um, reprehensible, but it's not just about things that are said. It's allowing groups to organize, amplify. Correct. Um, who are groups that in many cases are their, their goal is literally to overthrow democracy um, mm. or sort of white supremacists. Now there's a difference between saying, Hey, saying something that is, we may, we might find heinous, but in a free society, I think that that at some level should, you know, is what it means as to organize. If you look at January 6th, there was a bunch of organizing going behind the scenes of who was going to have guns where that's conspiracy. Being able to say things is different. And I think that's the distinction. And one of the reasons we talk about actor networks is it's not just about what's said. It's actually the networks that are organizing behind it and allowing people to do that and radicalize each other, like proper extreme radicalization. And if it was if it was uh, sort of political Islam, we would be because that's how we sort of see it. But the other types of, of radicalization, we're getting more uncomfortable with it. One can argue as to why that might be because of the people involved. But um, the fact is that that's where law has come down to. How are these systems enabling people to, to organize and radicalize each other and create these kind of ecosystems that are self 
reinforcing and, yeah. and really radicalizing. But it, it sounds in a, in a way, I mean, you're right that we kind of, we, we invent democracy and then we go, okay, that's done. So now we can just live happily ever after when it is a daily hourly process of, of making sure. So it looks to me like, you know, the big platforms do this. It is costly. Maybe there are political inclinations. I mean, you get Don Twitter off, uh, Donald Twitter off Twitter in, in a nanosecond. Right. It doesn't take long to do that, but it's much harder to take off the folks that are creating networks because you'd have to do the kind of research you're doing. And that's but in the end, the question is, you know, who are the core leaders? Um, right. And and is being taken off a platform. Does that mean your free speech is gone? I mean, you can still write. And I think, you know, Trump's a good example. He's just yeah. off a platform. He, he created his own platform. He can exactly. still go to the news. The question yeah. is, is it amplified through those networks? And I think that's where things get a little bit more challenging because he's, it's not like they put him in jail and like put mm. a gag around him. They just didn't give him this gigantic platform to be able to use now. But the cases in like Myanmar where um, genocidal forces not only sort of whipped up the genocide and then organize the genocide, but it, right. it was fundamental to the extent to which um, certain individuals were able to sort of whip up entire communities into this sort of frenzy. Um, that was like five people. Um, so, you know, is, is there something to be said for, and again, I mean, anyone can yell fire anywhere they want, except if you are in a theater. And at yeah. that point, yelling fire in a theater is one of the only restrictions because guess what? People run out of the theater and get hurt. And, and to yeah. me, it's very similar. It's not a matter of free speech is where is that free speech being said and in what moment? And if there is a, a moment in time, let's say, you know, a conflict is about to happen. I think then you just, you can probably put a, a dampener on some of these things so that you don't have that same connectivity that would otherwise be there. And I think that's where we think some of this is going and where, ought, where it ought to go. But but can an algorithm do that or to get back to your, no. we need the human in the loop. Like We need the human in the loop. <laughs> but the fact is, if you have, those if you've hired two people to cover Asia for right. a company, right. for a trillion dollar company, that right. to me shows, and what people don't often don't realize is that most of the moderation done by Facebook, and I should, and I have to be as transparent, I'm partly funded by Facebook. You wouldn't know by the, how I talk about it, but so, you know, the center is partly funded by it in, in some research we're looking at um, how humanitarians are being targeted online in, in the Philippines. Okay. But um, the ability of um, these platforms to be able to amplify these voices is very real. But the question is, um, what are we going to do? And, and I think this is where, from our perspective, there is a lot that can be done. If you only have one or two people covering an entire country, how could you possibly have any sense of what's going on there in any real way? So algorithms can't do it, but frankly, you don't need, I mean, <laughs> we're a relatively small center of like, you know, a dozen yeah. people, not even. We were able to do this in a matter of weeks and months with yeah. very limited resources. Yeah. Um, so we don't have millions or billions of dollars behind us. So uh, my sense is that a lot more could be done um, than is being done. And it's all like, it's too difficult, it's too difficult. But yeah. in the end, I think we show that what a tiny little institute can identify very quickly um, without any of those resources. And we're talking- And, you know, and to drill it through, not to exactly. get to the obvious, you know, the last tweet that exactly. Joe Lowe, uh, exactly. you know, put out, but to, to get- To understand to the network and who's driving it. And therefore, if you were just to suspend those 12 people, sure, yeah. they might adapt and get new accounts. But the fact is all those right. people following them can't, won't know who to necessarily follow. So you just disrupt right. things at moments at certain times. Now, the question is, you know, who do you disrupt and when? And yes, that might be a little more challenging, but uh, the Taliban at the time were killing NATO forces. So I think that that's a pretty safe one. Um, yep. The genocide is coming or we see violence beginning to start in a country, shut it down, you know, shut down those core networks that are doing it. Yeah, that seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, and yep. isn't an edge case, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, and the, the, I think the convoy here is probably a little different. But when they're yep. raising tens of millions of dollars, um, in slightly dubious ways, that was shut down. So that's an example of where it was shut down and the money. But, but, but post facto, um, exactly. GoFundMe came in and said, no, actually that, you know, so you react to the. Exactly. The it's all reactive. Information of the moment. We didn't exactly. know, you know. And, so and you can does. imagine if that's one that got attention, but imagine all yes. the other examples. Yes. yes. And that's what always, 
Yes, and in that case, it was handled well. But that's probably one of a thousand going on that day in, yeah. in, the, in the world. So, so I don't know. I I don't want to put you on the spot here, but if Facebook is in part funding you, are um, and your this report's talking about Twitter, so they might be happy with that. But do they? Do you get a sense that they're that they are trying to fund some of this stuff because they figure out if they don't do it, um, eventually they may be held accountable, especially in the United States. They're a very litigious society. Yeah. <laughs> um, so far, they've avoided that with much. Uh, I mean, the amount of funding they give out is you know relatively small in the grand scheme okay. of things from, from their perspective. I, I think they do this partly. You could probably make an argument on both sides. Um, yeah. You could probably say this is a bit like... Um, Big oil giving out giving out uh, funding for these things. Um, at the same time, you know there is obviously a desire to to start looking at some of this. We actually didn't use any of the Facebook money for this for the, for we're that stuff. Funded, this is all funded through the Canadian um, the Shirk, the Canadian uh, Social Science uh, Research yeah. um, sort of pot of money, um, and so that we we made very clear to sort of separate yeah, that distinct. out. Um, we haven't actually even started the, the Facebook research yet. Um, we've been a little busy with this. Okay, so, it, so we're going to talk again when you start. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we cause a bit more trouble and a little bit more, and the world has a little bit more time to uh, to to uh, take it up and, and hold people a little bit more accountable than it seems to be on this yeah. one, which we found a bit. Is, is that, are you going to try and put the same lens on Facebook? Is that what you mean? Or are you doing we're, different issues? We're going to do different issues. We're going to do, and, and it, we're, we're going to follow it. It depends on, you know, different countries have, um, different patterns of usage. And, and that's just a fancy way of yeah. saying some countries use Facebook more than others. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things that we found in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, and this is important, is one of the reasons the Afghans, they are the uh, Taliban used Twitter was because, and they posted like 20 or 30 times, or I think it was 20 times more on on Twitter than they did on Facebook. We, we are actually aren't 100% sure why. It might have been that Facebook did a better job of, of curtailing the activity yeah. than, than Twitter did. And so, so they went to the path of least resistance. It's exactly correct. Um, and so we're digging into that more to better understand, um, if so, how and why. Um, and what does that teach us about the nature of moderation and, and compensating? Wow. Well, this is a really, really interesting bit of work you're on to here. Well, we hope we think so. Um, it keeps <laughs> us, it keeps us, it keeps us uh, intrigued and fascinated if, if depressed and a little, uh, yes. a little sort of, <laughs> well, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm heartened by it in the sense that you, you do seem to be like what we're wa which, watching now is just knee jerk response. Somebody says something we disagree with, Ben. Exactly. And then that, it's that is not the answer, right? And there's the and Twitter pile on that happens five minutes, nine yeah. minutes later, and everyone gives them their opinion. Yeah. No, this is really important. Thanks, Brian. A great conversation. The, the, the pleasure was mine. I look forward to great. talking again in the future. Um, oh, we, we will. And good indeed. luck with your work uh, pushing Canada on some of these issues. Because I think yeah. one of the things that also comes out of this research is that. Um, a lot of this and a lot of what's going on is, is the U.S. focus, both on right. the far right. right and everything else. But the fact is those networks operate differently. We started doing some research here in Canada. Those networks operate very differently in Canada. It's not just an extension of networks. And it's very different in their patterns of social media and, and how they use it and, and how they're funded. And so we really need to have Canadian solutions to Canadian problems. It's yeah, not a matter really of... Is yeah, of waiting for the Americans to deal with this problem. Because the fact is, even if they do, that does not mean they're dealing with Canadian problems. And so yeah. it really does um, behoove the, the Canadian government to better understand these dynamics, understand the patterns of how it's happening in Canada, and to really say what, how is social media and conflict. So for example, and this is one of the ones that shocked us, when some of the resident school um, revelations came out in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. um, in a matter of hours, it was it was basically transformed into disinformation by the Chinese government and the Russian government and fed back into Facebook, because at the time, the Canadian government was about to hold them accountable in the Human Rights Council in at the United Nations. And so they were sort of they were using a very local, I mean, obviously, it was a national story, yeah. but a very yeah. sort of no, no. national to then transform that, you know, how dare Canada talk about these, you know, about what's going on with Uyghurs and when they're doing China, this when, when they've are when they're what they're doing is worse. Um, and so the ability, which isn't disinformation, but how they were able to use it and transform yeah. it in matter of like hours. Yeah, is, you know, there are some unique things that Canada is going to have to deal with and understand. Dr. Brian McGuinn. McQuinn, but that's okay. McQuinn. I like it. It's okay. No, you're right. McQuinn. I'm looking at you. I like McQuinn. It works too. 
It's no, very Irish. We'll go, I think we'll go with <laughs> I think we'll, we'll go with McGinn McQuinn. There I'm you just going to call you Brian. I, I I prefer Brian if that's okay. <laughs> that's that, that's fine, Senator. Professor of Politics and International Studies uh, at the University of Regina, my alma mater. Exactly. Uh, Center for. Um, Artificial intelligence, conflict, and data also operating there, but all in conjunction with other universities, which I think is the way to do it. So if you want to try and find this report, it's called Power by Twitter, Powered by Twitter. This is about the Taliban. Give us some of your coordinates so people can look things up. Um, I mean, they, they just type that in um, or the center or my name, it yeah. will all come up. Uh, there's a number of links um, when you type in you know, Taliban and Twitter. Um, or Tata it'll eventually come conflict, up. Okay. It, it'll come up. But SIDAC um, are uh, basically it's tracesofconflict.com. Um, okay. Of conflict.com and is our website. Um, and But it's pretty easy to find either my name yeah. or otherwise. Um, and B R I A N M C C Q U I N N. But you can put a G in there if you want, everyone. So this is the power of being a senator, you see? Just, yeah, just next time. Next time I'll change. Thank you so much. It was just. Pleasure was mine. Yeah, okay. really interesting conversation. We will talk again soon. I hope so. Thanks. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. And we'll talk soon as well. Bye-bye for now. Bye.